Extreme. Well, welcome to Trinity Church. You can respond. Hey, good morning, good morning. You at home, welcome as well. Thank you for joining us. This is a glorious day the Lord has made. We can sit here without face mask or with face mask of your choice, but it's no longer mandated, so that's wonderful. Would you stand, if you're able, for our call to worship? And let's join together in that response. This is Trinity Sunday, and Trinity Sunday is the Sunday that we celebrate the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you'll see in your worship guide a rather lengthy uh, a paragraph or two about the doctrine of the Trinity. So I hope that you read that. Um, Maybe if the sermon gets a little dull for you, you can pull it out and start reading about the Trinity. I won't be offended. Let's join together now in our call to worship. Come, let us worship the Lord God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us bow down before him who alone is worthy of all praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord God Almighty, who is and was evermore shall be. Holy is your name. Come, let us sing for joy to God our strength. He's the judge of all the earth, and all the nations are his inheritance. Show, Show us your, your unfailing, unfailing love, love, O Lord, and lead us in the path of righteousness as we put our trust in you alone, our rock and our redeemer. Rise up, oh, you sleep. 
God, we give you thanks this morning. We give you praise, the three in one. We thank you that we see your goodness in each of your manifestations, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and in the dance that you invite us into, that you do together. We pray that you would bless the service this morning, that you would draw us close to you, open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to the words that you have for us. Amen. You may be seated. Any uh, children that would like to go to Sunday school, uh, welcome to go out in the foyer. And Erica Elsey, our Sunday school superintendent, will be happy to take you to one of our classes. Well, this is also Memorial Day weekend, and um, I, one of the things I like to do here is to recognize any servicemen and women, veterans that have served our country in any of the branches of our military, would you kindly stand to be recognized, if you would, please? Amen. 
Amen. Please be seated. Also, uh, uh, Walter and Jane and Susan and I are now proud grandparents again, and so we, we rejoice in uh, Joya and Jake's uh, newest addition, a little girl, uh, Amaya Taylor, uh, Muti. So we, we praise the Lord for uh, that special one. Um, all right, well, let's pray together. Heavenly and Holy Father, we're thankful to gather here at Trinity Church and at home to, uh, to worship you, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Lord, as we worship, uh, whether it's here in the sanctuary or at other places, uh, Lord, we pray that uh, you would fill our hearts with, th with thankfulness for our veterans. We thank you, Lord, for those that have served in this country uh, in the present and the past, uh, honorably and lord we're grateful for their service to this country and on this memorial day weekend we want to especially give thanks to those that have paid the ultimate sacrifice and for those that have died in their service and lord we we remember the dead and we thank you for the living and we thank you lord for all the, the sacrifice and service that our men and women have done to keep this country free Lord, as we come before you, we uh, thank you for uh, the birth of uh, the special little girl. We thank you, Lord, for Amaya, and we pray your blessing upon Jake and Joya as new parents again, and we pray your special blessing upon them. Father, thank you for our, all our children. We thank you for our Sunday school, and Lord, we pray your blessing upon those children gathered here in this service and those that are our meeting at home, and those that are in Sunday school are downstairs. Pour out your spirit upon our children, for we were reminded of your word, let the little children come unto me and do not hinder them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Lord, as we gather here, we're thankful for here in Massachusetts that we can now have the freedom uh, to wear a face mask or not to wear a face mask in public worship and uh, Lord, in outdoor activities as well. And Lord, as, as we, we watch on the television how uh, the Bruins are, are packing out their, their uh, stadium and they're looking for the Celtics to pack out the garden, Lord, with uh, uh, the playoffs. And we think of the Red Sox in full capacity. And Lord, we pray that you'd bring full capacity to Trinity Church too. Lord, fill this place. Fill this place with people that are not just excited about a hockey puck or a basketball hoop, but are excited about Jesus Christ and, and long to, to worship together with others in a corporate setting. So, Lord, bring the people back and build this church. And we thank you, Lord, for the faithful members of this church. And we pray that you would continue to grow us upward and outward. Lord, we also pray for the baccalaureate service this Tuesday. Thank you for Pastor Eric and his leadership and for all those uh, high school graduates that will be uh, sharing uh, speeches and prayers and scripture readings and, and music. Father, bless this uh, special gathering here Tuesday night. Father, and we pray that you'd stir, not only bless uh, our graduates and their parents and family, but for all of us uh, to come on out and support our most recent high school graduates. And Father, as we as we come before you, we want to pray that uh, for Tom Potomato, we pray for him in a special way uh, as uh, he was taken to the hospital this morning. Lord, hear our prayer for Brother Tom, and we thank you for Frank's willingness to step in to read scripture uh, for Tom. Father, thank you for hearing our prayers, and hear us further as we pray together the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, glory forever. Amen. Well, we have a special edition that's not in your program. And it's a video for special music 
uh, done by Robin Langberg. And so, look at the stars. And right after uh, she, she leads us in this special music, then uh, Frank will come and lead us in the reading of Scripture. Consider the stars in the sky Look up and wonder Can you count their number? Consider the stars in the sky dance floor of heaven Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see uh, a bunch of people here in the room. So, 
Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the book of Job, uh, chapter 5, verses 6 through 13. It's Job 5, 6 through 13. Is tasteless food eaten without salt, or is there flavor in the white of an egg? I refuse to touch it. Such food makes me ill. Oh, that I might have my request, that God would grant what I hope for, that God would be willing to crush me, to let loose his hand and cut me off. Then I would still have this consolation, my joy in unrelenting pain, that I had not denied the words of the Holy One. What strength do I have that I should still hope? What prospects that I should be patient? Do I have the strength of, a, of stone? Is my flesh bronze? Do I have any power to help myself now that success has been driven from me? I wonder, I thought that didn't really fit. <laughs> That's Job 6, 6 through 13. Let's do Job 5, 6 through 13. How about? For hardship does not spring from the soil, nor does trouble sprout from the ground. Yet man is born to trouble, as surely as sparks lie upward. But if it were, I would appeal to God. Uh, I would lay my cause before him. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. He bestows rain on the earth. He sends water upon the countryside. The lowly he sets on high, and those who mourn are lifted to safety. He thwarts the plans of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. He catches the wise in their craftiness, and the schemes of the wily are swept away. It's much better with the theme of the sermon. <laughs> our, our gospel reading is Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34 a favorite passage of many of us. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And then finally, the New Testament reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verses 18 through 23. Do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about men. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life, or death, or the present, or the future, all are yours, and you are all of Christ, and Christ is of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his holy and inspired word. Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, let's pray as we get ready to hear a message from God's word for us for today. Lord, thank you for all of scripture and we thank you for uh, the text before us. And Lord, open our eyes and our hearts and, uh, to, to the truth that will transform us. And we pray your anointing upon the preaching of, of the word of God to the glory of your great name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, today is the, the ninth message in our series on the book of 1 Corinthians, and if you uh, have a desire to 
to go back over the other eight sermons previous to this. Uh, They're certainly available for you on our church website. Well, today's message is entitled, Putting Your Trust in God Alone. And our primary text is 1 Corinthians 3, 18 to 23. And as we get started, I want to ask you an important question. And this is the question, how easy is it for you to trust God? How easy is it for you to trust God? Well, if we're honest with ourselves, we'll probably say it all depends. (laughs) It depends on what we're talking about. Do I trust God that there'll be a parking spot waiting for me at Trinity Church on Sunday morning and Memorial Day? Yeah, doesn't take a lot of trust for that, all right? We got a lot of parking spots out there for people. But to say, do I trust in God for my children or a situation at work? Or do I trust God for a future partner for me uh, to get married someday, if that would be God's will? Or do I trust God for a health concern that I have? You may say, well, that may be a little different. That may be a little more challenging. Uh, And trusting God is a fundamental question to the Christian life, and whatever the case may be. Well, the Bible says this, and we'll put the scripture up for you at home and here at the church. Familiar passage from Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. It says simply this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. God wants to lead you in a straight path. He wants to provide for you. He wants to protect you. He wants to bless you. In fact, he said, I have come into this world that you may have life and life to the full. That's his desire for you. He wants to give us that abundant life. And he calls us to trust in him trust in him. We we heard about that in the the gospel lesson that was read about, you know, don't worry about what clothing you're going to wear and don't worry worry about uh, those things that we need to eat and so forth. Look at the birds of the air. He cares for them. He will care for you. It all hinges upon our choosing to trust in God with our complete being, our emotions, our intellect, our spirit, our decision-making, finding that straight path that God promised us to lay out before us. But our part is to lean not on our own wisdom and understanding. Now, that's easier said than done. Some of us are planners. Some of us are not planners. Some of us have, have, a, have a five-year plan for their life. Others don't have a plan for the next five minutes, what they're going to do. Well, if you're a planner and you love to, to, to organize things and have a plan, uh, sometimes things don't work out the way that you planned them. And sometimes things happen that cause, causes us to have to, to come up with a new plan. Finding the straight path that God promises to lay out before us demands that we lean not on our own wisdom and understanding and choose the path of submitting to God and be willing to change our, our plans in accordance with his purposes and his will. Well, one of the biggest mistakes that we often make is trusting in our own heart, trusting in our own feelings, trusting in our own planning instead of God alone. We see this core value in the world repeated again and again, where human wisdom says simply this, just trust your heart. Now, some of you know that Susan and I are Hallmark fans, and, and we watch a lot of Hallmark, not only Christmas time, not only Christmas in July, but around the whole year. And I tell you, I wish I had a dime for every time I heard in a, in a film like that, just trust your heart. Wow. Well, that's a... That's the core value of the world, to trust our heart. But the Bible leads us in a very different direction. Trusting in this wisdom of the world 
we take a big step away from the opposite direction of what God com commands us to do. To lean not on our own understanding, but to acknowledge him in all our ways, submit to him, and he will make our paths straight. Well, that's exactly what's going on in the church at Corinth. And the Apostle Paul addresses the believers in this first century church. They are trusting their heart. They're trusting their wisdom. They're trusting their planning. And they need a course correction. A course correction. An about face. And that, this is what he says to them. And we'll put the scripture up there for you. The New Living Translation says, Stop deceiving yourselves. If you think you're wise by this world's standards, you need to become a fool to be truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. As the scripture says, he traps the wise in the snare of their own cleverness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. He knows that they are worthless. As we've seen in our exposition of the book of 1 Corinthians so far, the believers in Corinth are boasting about their wisdom. They're so smart. They're so wise. They're so cunning. They're so clever, you see. And they're departing from the centrality of the cross of Christ. And they're deceived into thinking that their wisdom was sufficient for obtaining salvation and for building up the church, growing the church. Paul says these believers were actually self-deceived. Self-deceived. It wasn't Satan's doing. It was their own doing. Their own pridefulness, their own arrogance uh, that was saying that they didn't need to live a life of faith. They didn't need to trust in God uh, in completely. They could figure it all out. They could trust in their own wisdom. They could follow their own heart. Don't we see the same thing, brothers and sisters, when, when God tells us in the scriptures uh, and, and we question whether it's true or not? We doubt the goodness of God when we face trials and difficulties. And sometimes we even question the sovereignty of God when, when life takes a different turn than we were planning. Well, I don't think anyone was planning for this pandemic like this and say, all right, once March comes, I'm going to just plan to hang out at home and, you know, renew things there. And I'm just going to wear a face mask and I'm just going to not go to church, maybe I'll, I'll tune in at home or whatever the case may be. I don't think anyone was planning for that. Well, that's just one of many things that happen, that uh, things happen to us. Even our, our well-thought-through plans, our choosing to lean on our own understanding. Well, C.S. Lewis says this, this is a big part of trusting, knowing what God says, believing it to be true, and obeying him even when we don't get it. I love that. Even when we don't get it, trusting God when we say, I don't understand what's happening. There are a number of things that God tells us which are really end for end from the perspective of our own thinking. End for end, upside down. It seems hard to really grasp. For example, the Bible says when you're weak, then you're strong. Or do you want to lead others? Then you must serve them. Human wisdom is folly. To find yourself, to reach your God-given potential, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow him. That's end for end, isn't it? True greatness is not found in pride and self-confidence, but in humility and washing other people's feet. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Forgive one another their trespasses as your heavenly Father has forgiven you. End for end. Sometimes we say, no, I want to get even. I mean, I don't want to forgive this person. I want to get my pound of flesh. No, 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 no. that's not the way of the Bible. The way of the Bible is to, is to forgive. Don't worry about what you eat or drink. What do you mean don't worry about what I'm going to eat or drink? I, I, I gotta, I'm concerned about that. I want to know what I'm having for lunch. I want to know what I'm having for supper and the next day. And I want to know what's for dessert. And I want to know what time is going to be served and on and on and on. It's like, these are important things. Well, it says, don't worry about these things, what you eat or drink or wear. But seek first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added to you as well, you see. That's trusting in God. He, he, he wants to care for us. And he will care for us as we trust in him. 
but put our trust. Trusting in God alone entails leaning not on our own understanding, obeying God, even when God's commands given to us in Scripture seem end to end to our own understanding, contrary to our human thinking. Paul uses two Old Testament Scriptures to support that the wisdom of men is deemed foolishness in God's sight. And first, it's from Job, chapter 5 and verse 12, that was read earlier in our service, saying that God traps the wise in the snare of their own cleverness. Or put like this, here's the English Standard Version, he frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. How many of you are glad when God frustrates your plans? Come on, get those hands up. Come on. It's got to be someone who's glad when God frustrates your plans. Well, normally we're not. We're just not because we have our plans. We, we want it to be sunny and warm and have a picnic on Memorial Day. I'm frustrated. Why? Why are we frustrated? Maybe God is saying that the earth needs the water. It's, it's, a, it's a drought, and people need to be back in church. So come on in and huddle up where it's warm and gather together. He frustrates the devices of the crafty so our hands achieve no success. Not that he's a, a devious God or capricious. He loves us. He knows what's best for us. And then he, he, Paul quotes this second scripture from Psalm 94, 11, the Lord knows all human plans. He knows that they are futile. And so Paul, in a direct and forceful manner, declares once again that the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. Conclusion of the matter is that no believing disciple of Christ can rightfully, can rightfully boast about their wisdom and their attainments, nor in the attainments of their favorite teacher. For, their, uh, for a true Christ follower, trust in God alone triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's no room for boasting before God. There's just no room. There's no room for it all, particularly when it comes to our own thoughts, our own, uh, our own wisdom. God's wisdom is supreme and can be trusted. When you trust someone in everyday life, what do you base that trust on? When you trust someone, what do you base that trust on? Interesting, I uh, some years ago, I saw a survey about the most trusted profession around. I was hoping pastor would make the top 10, but sadly it did not. Not even close, which is a great sadness to my heart. One of the top professions of trusted people were pharmacists. You trust your pharmacist. Dentists, I think, were kind of really low on the, on the thing, and lawyers and politicians and pastors, unfortunately. Well, how do you trust someone? What's it based upon? Well, trusting a person, the fact is that they treated you well. They've shown you honesty over and over again. You go to the pharmacist, they treat you well, they give you the right medicine, you take it, you don't feel like they're going to switch the bottles on you and say, oh, I can't wait to do this. I'm going to give them this instead of that. Well, he said, if they did that once, you probably wouldn't trust them very much anymore. And they'd lose their license and per perhaps even more. Trust is based upon someone that treats you well, has shown you honesty over and over again. They've earned your trust. Well, it's similar with God. How does God prove his trustworthiness to us? One, through his character his qualities that are revealed in Scripture. When you study, you learn the character, the attributes of God. And you learn that he's merciful, he's gracious, he's slow to anger, he's abounding in steadfast love. Therefore, I can trust in him. This is his character. This is who he is. And secondly, through his care for you in your life. Looking back over your life and you see how God has helped you and cared for you, take time to reflect upon that to help you to see that God is worthy of your trust in the present because he cared for you in the past and therefore you can put your trust in him for your present circumstance. And thirdly, through recounting how he's answered prayer in your life. When you bring to mind the many times that God has answered prayer in your life uh, beyond what you could imagine, this gives you that confidence that you can trust in God 
for the next thing, for the next situation that is facing you. And the uh, 8 o'clock service, God brought to my mind an illustration that I shared with another person this week about trusting in God. And I thought about some years ago when I was in Gordon-Conwell, I went with Susan and some others to India for six weeks for a mission trip. And we were on a, on a train across the country from Bombay to Calcutta. And as we were going, it was a pretty scary experience uh, for a lot of reasons. And <laughs> I won't go into all of those, but I will say we stopped at one place around Varanasi, um, and, and we went there and, and were waiting and surrounded by a mass of people that uh, were kind of curious, because after all, with, with uh, uh, five people of a very fair complexion, amongst the people with a darker hue to their complexion, we stuck out, and they all came around to see, what are we doing there, and what, what's it all about? Well, I could understand most of what was being said, because it was in Hindi or some other, one of the many dialects uh, uh, in India, and uh, one person came up to me, and it was going like this, showing his bicep, had a big turban, and he was looking at me, and he had kind of, you know, surly attitude, and I said, I don't think he's part of the welcome wagon here in Varanasi, and I thought, he probably wants, wants me uh, taken, taken out. And I said, well, I'll just smile, and just, just smile, and, and just be friendly. So oh, nice to see you, it's, you got a great country and so forth. And, and, uh, and I said, Lord, I'm in your hands. I trust in you. I trust that you will protect me and my wife and the rest of us. Uh, nothing I can do about this situation. We're outnumbered uh, and outmuscled as well. Well, this one guy came up to me and said, do you know what this guy is saying to you? I said, I don't have a clue. He said, he wants you dead. I said, oh, that's a little disconcerting. I said, well, he's not going to be able to accomplish that because my life is in God's hands and he can't take it from me, I'm thinking. So I'm going to smile. So I smile and just God fill me with peace and we're saying, oh, it's so great to be here in this country. You People are so friendly. I, I, there's so many people here. This is, this is an awesome experience. And the guys, they just left. No fight took place. They didn't take our lives. Well, that was a time that God heard my prayer and saved us and protected us. And so when other times go, and, and I'm wondering, like, what's going to happen in this situation, I revisit that from time to time in my mind. Say, Lord, you helped me back then. Maybe you can help me with this situation. And you can do the same. We can revisit and think about how God answers prayer and helps us to trust in him for the present. And then fourthly, through the cross of Christ. If nothing else, the cross is more than enough proof that God has earned your trust. He is willing for his son to die for you so that you may be forgiven of your sins. There's no greater love. And so we can trust in God uh, the, with all our lives and all our being and not cling to our human wisdom because he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. The greatest reason of all, to trust in God. Well, Paul continues in 21 to 23 says this so then no more boasting about human leaders all things are yours whether paul or apollos or cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future all are yours and you are of christ and christ is of god all things are yours paul says to the believers at the church at corinth everything belongs to you and you belong to christ and christ belongs to god the point that paul is making is simply that for the disciple of Jesus Christ, sons and daughters that are born of the Spirit, we belong to God. We belong to Him. You're His. And because all things are under the headship of Christ, all things are created by Him and for Him, everything belongs to you by inheritance. For He has overcome the world. Christ Jesus has overcome death. He's overcome sin and Satan. He's overcome the present. He will overcome the future. And since we belong to God the Father, we will share in that inheritance. We will share in that inheritance of Christ over all things. For the believing disciple of Jesus Christ, all things are ours. That's what he says. 
All things are ours in Christ. Everything is given by God for the believer's benefit, the believer's blessing. We are Christ. Earlier we heard a song that Robin Langberg sang about see the stars. Well, we'll show this image now. The cosmos and the world itself, the process of living and dying, the present and the future, are all to be viewed in relationship to God's purposes and plans for his redeemed people. So as we see the stars and we see the world around us, the cosmos and everything, we are to see it viewed in relationship to God's purposes and plans for us. It's the result of a relationship with Christ that we share with Christ in his inheritance. Paul, in this crescendo in his appeal to the church at Corinth, and to you and me as well, says, put your trust in God. Don't trust in your own understanding. Trust in his supreme wisdom given to us in Scripture, because everything belongs to God. And through our relationship with him, all things will be given to us as well. Ephesians 1 puts it this way, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he's blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. All things are united together in him. And because we are in Christ, all things are ours, Paul says, to the believers in heaven and on earth. God's plan is that his son Christ would be supreme over all things, including life and death, present and future, principalities all over the world. God is the one who possesses all things that outside of him, whose ultimate control lies nothing. In other words, the story does not end with Jesus' victory over the grave. There's more to the story. There's more to the story after the resurrection. And that is the restoration of creation is yet to happen. Romans 8 puts it this way in this vision of the ultimate restoration of creation beautifully. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption, obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God, for we know whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves, with the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. The garden is yet to be restored. But as we turn to the final chapters of the Bible, we see the end of the story, the conclusion of the grand arc of redemption that began in chapter 3 of Genesis. In Revelation 21, the Apostle John gives this vision of God's plan for the future. Revelation 21 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth that passed away was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Her loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among his people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eye. No more death. No more COVID. No more mourning. No more crying. No more arthritis. No more loss of vision. No more singing off tune, out of key. Don't elbow the person beside you if they have trouble with that. Right? Be kind, kind. A new order. He who is seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy 
and true. We can trust in them. They're true. He said, it is done. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. The thirsty will give water without cost for the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. I'll be their God. They'll be my children. Those who are in me will inherit all of this, the Lord says. Christ will make everything new. He will reverse the curse which sin brought upon the earth. No more death or dying, and so forth. Goodness of creation that was lost in Eden will be restored. And we find this in Revelation 22, the end of the story. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, no more pollution, flowing from the throne of God out of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed. The garden will be restored. What was made wrong will soon be made right. Everything will be made new. Made new. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Therefore, let us put aside all boasting and all pride in our human wisdom. Let us come together and build the church of Jesus Christ. As a community of God's chosen people, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, let's put our trust in God alone. We want to grow this church, do we not? We all need to do our part. Plant seeds, water the seeds, invite people, show up ourselves, come and trust in God. Put our trust in God. That's what it's all about. Trusting in Him for whatever it is that we're facing. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so blessed and challenged this morning by the Apostle Paul in this letter to the church at Corinth. Lord, as we, we consider their human pride and their boastfulness and their own wisdom, their own intellect and their own planning, Father, we can see a little bit or maybe a lot of ourselves in this church at Corinth. And Lord, help us to learn from their mistake, and help us to trust in you wholly, entirely, for everything that we're facing. Lord, you know what burdens our hearts and the things that, that give us great, great concern. And Father, it may be our kids, it may be their education, it may be their mental health, it may be their, their well-being, their careers, their partners in life, whatever the case. Father, you know what concerns our hearts. Our retirement, our health, concern of the, the nation, prejudice, pollution in the world. Father, any number of things can fill us with great dread. Help us to put our hope in you, to trust in you entirely, for you are worthy of all trust every area of our life. Some things it's easy to trust in you, God. Other things it's hard. Give us the grace to trust in you for the difficult things as well as the easy things. And we thank you that you are trustworthy. And we thank you, Lord, that you're faithful and that all things have been given to us in Christ. And therefore, we rest in that, that reality, that truth, and we thank you for this, uh, this time together in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said, amen. Amen indeed. Okay. Let's stand together in body or in spirit and worship. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We have died. 
thinking about all of you that are here and all of you that are listening at home and I thought about a conversation I had with uh, Marnie Smith so Marnie if you're listening in a shout out to you Marnie told me that she listens to the sermon once sometimes twice sometimes three times she listens to the service so Marnie keep it up and Dave and Linda Lawrence that are faithfully listening at home and so many others so many others thank you we're going to continue the live stream, especially for people just like you. But also, we want to invite you to come, come out, come out to the service if you're able. Next week, if you like variety, this week is for you. We got 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, it'll be 90s, all temperature. Pick your, your favorite temperature. You're going to get it this week. And Lord willing, next Sunday it'll be in the 90s. We'll have a picnic outside, so you may want to dress with shorts and T-shirts and that type of things for a picnic after the 1030 service. And Lord willing, if it's raining, we'll be inside. If it's sunny, we'll be outside and, and we'll find some shade. And I probably won't be wearing this next week. All right? One person was listening, and they said they saw me with a suit and tie for the 8 o'clock. They said, Mr. Smith, I thought you said you're wearing shorts and t-shirts this week. I said, that's before I knew what the weather was going to be like. So, well, just come, come on out next week for a special picnic and a time of worship. And uh, there's Avani smiling away. Nice to see Avani in church. Well, let's receive the benediction. And now, may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with you all and all those whom you love. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.